Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 17 through 26. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him, and he healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Maybe those words sounded familiar to you, but a little bit different, because that is what Luke gospel refers to as the Sermon on the Plain. Actually, Luke didn't say that. We call it the Sermon on the Plain as opposed to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And the words are a little different because instead of blessed are you who are poor in spirit, meaning those of you who have come to understand that all you can rely on is God, it's blessed are you who are poor. It's not blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's blessed are you who are hungry now. You're going to be filled. And the, the promise to those who are grieving is not that they'll be comforted, but they will laugh. If you're sorrowful now and crying now, you're going to laugh one day. We're talking about and why we call it the leveling plane of this great teaching of Jesus is because it's really a reversal of fortunes. It goes back to what his mother Mary said in what we call the Magnificat, when the angel came to her and said, don't be afraid, you're going to have a baby, it's going to be God's son. And she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is expecting her baby, Jesus' cousin John the Baptist. What does she say? That God has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. Real reversal of things, don't you think? Then John the Baptist, quoting the prophet Isaiah when he is out there baptizing people and telling them about the one who's coming after him, the one whose sandals he is unworthy to untie, the one who is greater than he will ever be. He says, every valley shall be lifted, every mountain made low. The uneven shall be made level and the rough places a plain. It's a reversal of fortunes. And we're talking about blessings, not, not something that's just sort of a good thought, because sometimes it's translated as happy. It's more substantive than being happy, because we can be happy about a lot of things. But when you are blessed by God, when God has touched your heart, and you know that God's presence is with you, gives you strength to do all kinds of things. We also had in this something that's not in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, with the Beatitudes, as we call them, the blessed are those who... We have the woes. I have to understand that a woe is not the same as a curse, although we did have a curse mentioned in the reading from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was prophesying to people who had been very stubborn. They were relying on military strength. They were going to war with other nations. They were making treaties with other nations against yet other nations. They were turning from God and putting their faith in their own power. Now, that is when Jeremiah said, cursed are those who do these things. You're going to wither up like a shrub in the desert. You're going to be like you're bathing in salt. That's a curse. That's something that God's going to let them reap what they've sown more than God's doing it to them. But when we're talking about woe, we're not talking about a curse. So what does the word woe mean? I looked it up, and there are some interesting sort of uh, synonyms for woe in the dictionary. Maybe you can add to these two. They're interjections. It's more than a word. It's like a, a sound that means, ah, that's what a woe is. Uh-oh, that's one. Yikes, gadzooks, oi. Heavens to Betsy, oh dear, oh my, watch out, or the other, woe, as in stop, not as in W-O-E, but W-H-O-A, woe. Because it's a warning. It's not saying that God is going to punish you for these things. It's you're going to go, if you keep going in that direction, if you have more than you need and you refuse to share, 
if you hoard the things that God has given you, if you don't tell anyone the good news of Jesus Christ, if you don't share your faith, if you hold on to things at the expense of others, if you hold on to anger at the expense of others, at the expense of forgiving others, whoa, you are going to end up in a bad place that you don't want to be. Now, it's also a leveling place because everyone who comes to God has the chance for grace because equal access to grace levels the playing field, doesn't it? Everyone, those who are called to be careful, those who are told, whoa, are those, who are you? If you're, if you're full now, if you have everything you need now, watch out in the future. They still have access to grace. It's not a curse. It's not the end of the road for them. Jesus is telling people, this is how I want you to live. This is how you need to be with each other. Because if you are hungry and if people don't love you, if people revile you and curse you because of me, your reward is great in heaven. But whoa, if everybody loves you now, if everybody says just wonderful things about you, they did the same thing to the false prophets so long ago. It's a warning. It's also a promise but it gives us equal access to grace and levels the playing field. But more than that, what levels the playing field and what makes this all possible for us, because it doesn't necessarily feel blessed, does it people revile you or hate you or talk about you or curse you behind your back or tell you off to your face? It does not feel like a blessing, does it? That's when we have to cling to the resurrection, and that's what Paul is telling us. Belief in the resurrection is the greatest leveler of all. Because belief in the resurrection is what gives us life and hope. Because if we can believe that Christ was raised from the dead, we can believe that we are blessed, even though we don't necessarily feel it at the moment. We can believe we're blessed when we're hungry or when we're hurting or when we're reviled and excluded and just treated like dirt. It is the presence of God that we feel in those times that gives us strength. That comes from hope in the resurrection. What was it that Paul said? If Christ has not been raised, our proclamation is, your, is in vain and your faith has been in vain. So as long as we believe with all our hearts in the resurrection, we believe anything is possible. We believe it's possible for this pandemic one day to be over. We believe it's possible for people to come to Christ and find their hope and their healing in him. We believe it's possible to have a youth group with so many kids in it that we can't even count them. We believe in all these possibilities because we believe in the resurrection. And why do we believe in the resurrection? Because Jesus said to us that he was going to his father and he, where he was going, he would come back and take us with him. We believe in the resurrection because he told us it was ours for belief in him. That is why we have faith. And that's why we keep going no matter what happens to us in life. We can keep going into the strength of Christ and his promises. So how do we do that? We gotta plant ourselves near that water, just like the tree. I don't wanna be a shrub in the desert surrounded by a salt bath, do you? I want to be planted near the stream where the water can flow into my roots and give me strength and hope and peace and courage to keep going no matter what happens. We plant ourselves in faith near Christ when we proclaim his resurrection above all else. We hold on to that hope more dearly than anything into our lives. We know that his promises are true. We know that one day we will be with him because he will come back and he will take us to where he has been all these, these times when we don't have him with us in the flesh, but we have him with us in our spirit through his Holy Spirit living in us and working through us. When we come together in faith, when we come together, when we come to church again, when we share in communion, when we share in studying his word, when we pray together, when we pray for each other, that is when we are planting ourselves by the streams of the water of life. So maybe it didn't feel this morning like uh, you wanted to get up and get out into the world. Or maybe you're just so tired of being at home, you were desperate to get to church. It's coming back next week, I promise. We'll be there next Sunday. We will be together. We'll be together. I won't be there. I will be with you. I always tell, I told Mark Smiley when he agreed to preach for me that I always watch him preach online. He sort of said, uh-oh, woe is me then. But no, that was a joke. I will be with you in spirit, and then you'll be there in person, and the next week we'll all be together. So until that day, plant yourself in faith. Plant yourself in hope. Plant yourself by the water of life, and you will flourish like nothing you've ever seen. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen.